Uh, welcome everybody to the book launch uh, for Jordan Daniel Woods, The Whole Mystery of Christ, Creation as Incarnation in Maximus Confessor. Uh, my name is Justin Coyle. Uh, I teach uh, at Mount Angel Abbey Seminary, um, and I'm co-hosting the event with our good friend, Dr. Taylor Ross, uh, who has just finished defending his dissertation at Duke University and is off uh, to teach at Fordham in the spring. Um, so I will give uh, just a, a, an overview of what's going to happen, um, an introduction to some of the cast of characters that are going to speak, um, and then we'll get rolling if that's all right with everybody. Um, if at any point anybody has any questions uh, for any of the speakers or for Jordan in particular, please utilize the question and answers uh, function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, okay, so this is how things are gonna go. Um, after my introductions, I'm gonna pass things over to Taylor who will give a very brief uh, overview of the book in case folks aren't familiar with the argument. Um, then we'll pass things over uh, to uh, Father Deacon Brandon Gallagher uh, at, the, at the University of Exeter, at which point um, we'll pass things over again uh, to Dr. Aristotle Papa Nicolau uh, at Fordham, who's also co-director uh, of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center with George Dimacopoulos. Um, and we'll round things out with uh, some comments from Father John Baer, who has uh, left us stateside for Misty, Scotland. Um, after all of our panelists have spoken, we'll hear from Jordan Wood himself, um, who defended his dissertation, um, which was a seed form of the book uh, he's, he's, he's here to address us on today. In 2018, he's now at home prioritizing family life, though he's taught at lots of institutions, uh, especially on the East Coast. Um, and he's uh, happily, happily there with his with his daughters, but um, he he may be able to entertain some offers in case uh, they're too good to refuse. So shoot him an email. Um, and again, please utilize the Q and A function if at any point you have questions. Okay. All right. Turn things over to Taylor. Thanks, Justin. Um, I want to also thank the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University uh, for hosting this event. We're very grateful uh, for, for their hospitality. Um, please invite you to visit fordham.edu slash orthodoxy for more information about the center and also visit publicorthodoxy.org, uh, which is another outlet for the center. Uh, we can find some great writing on there as well. And this um, video will be on the center's YouTube channel uh, after the fact. So please look for it there too and share it widely. Um, my job this morning uh, is a pleasurable one. I have the great pleasure of introducing one of my favorite books uh, and giving uh, an overview of its argument as prelude to our discussion today. Uh, so the argument of Jordan Daniel Woods, The Whole Mystery of Christ, Creation as Incarnation and Maximus Confessor, Confessor amounts to many things. A searing critique of modern theology's systematic preference to, for Thomistic categories, a vivid demonstration of historical theology that would take seriously the grammar of that subdiscipline's title, a subtle case for the patristic roots of some of German idealism's signature insights. The list goes on, as our esteemed panelists will no doubt prove in due course. Before it amounts to any of those paradigm shifting interventions, however, the book is first and foremost a proposed solution to a puzzle in Maximus the Confessor's thought and modern scholarship thereupon. The riddle goes something like this. Just how seriously ought we take the Confessor's various claims throughout his corpus that creation obeys the same metaphysical logic that obtains in Christ's incarnation? When, for instance, Maximus declares, quote, the word of God, very God, wills always and everywhere to accomplish the mystery of his embodiment, as he does so memorably in Ambiguum 7, should we take him at his word? Or has the confessor merely indulged in a bit of metaphorical language? Must, in short, Maximus really mean what he says? By answering in the affirmative, by insisting, in other words, that the peculiar metaphysical relations which scaffold his neo-Chalcedonian Christology also furnish Maximus' confessor with a metaphysics of being at large, Jordan Wood distinguishes his reading of the Byzantine theologian from at least three versions of the same in modern scholarship. One, an analogized Maximist. Two, a Neoplatonic Maximus. And three, a Thomistic Maximus. 
So first, uh, analogized Maximus, he rejects the view of those like Hansers von Balthasar, who may be willing to accept, perhaps even retrieve, the Christological grounding of creation in Maximus, but who nonetheless subordinate the confessor's talk of hypostatic identity between Christ's natures to the Chalcedonian watchword of unconfused when it comes to applying that logic of incarnation to creation as a whole, and who therefore mistake the metaphysical pe peculiarity of Neo-Chalcedonian Christology for something like the analogy of being uh, of a Thomistic vintage. Second, and relatedly, he parts ways with those who would reduce the Maximian doctrine of creation, whether in protology or eschatology, to an exemplary species of participation in the Neoplatonic sense. And this because the logic of Methexis would make theological nonsense of the very mystery on which Maximus claims to pattern his metaphysics namely the union of divine and human natures in the hypostasis of Christ. Much like Balthazar and company, this platonizing tendency in modern scholarship on Maximus turns out to be suggesting that Maximus derived from Christ something more like epistemic justification, as Jordan calls it, for an abstract principle which is by, by definition separable from the incarnation itself. Not, in other words, as Jordan wants, the metaphysical form of creation as such. Third, and finally, the whole mystery of Christ distinguishes itself from scholarship of a previous generation that merely saw in Maximus a notable precursor to Thomas Aquinas. In each case, Jordan shows that modern scholarship has balked at precisely the same place and in precisely the same way that Maximus's first and greatest reader in the West did long ago. Like John Scotus Eriugena, that is, they miss the provocation and promise of Maximus' confessor's theology by making his otherwise literal claims about the identity of Christ and, create, and, and creation into so many suggestive metaphors. So rather than indexing his putatively Chalcedonian vision to analogy or participation or some other such abstraction, Jordan argues that Maximus's Weltbild, as Balthazar once called it, cleaves relentlessly to a Christo logic disclosed in the actual event of incarnation itself. That logic on Jordan's reading bears three distinctive features. First, one, the only sort of identity that applies to modally distinct natures is hypostatic identity. Two, their hypostatic identity in and as him thus names the condition of possibility for the generation of Christ's divine and human natures. Third, the mode of relation that obtains between these essentially disparate natures must therefore be that of perichoresis. And if it follows, Maximus really does make his Neo-Chalcedonian Christology a fundamental law of metaphysics, as Balthazar and company want to claim, the resulting ontology will have to follow that self-same logic, which could only mean that in hypostatization into and as Christ's composite person, names the purpose for which all things were made. Indeed, it would have to mean that creation isn't yet itself, isn't yet the object of God's creative intention until it subjects itself to the words incarnation. So runs the stirring thesis of Jordan's book. But the far more provocative claim, I think, is that only such a radical gloss on the God-world relation actually makes sense of the Maximian corpus itself. Which is to say, this monograph is less a creative reinterpretation of a perennial figure than it is a bid to read him correctly, perhaps for the very first time. And that his argument opens new vistas for systematic theology is not only testament to Jordan's own speculative prowess, therefore, but also, I think, a monument to the singular genius of Maximus himself. Suffice it to say, I think we're all very lucky, indeed, that the latter, the confessor, has found a worthy scholiast in Dr. Wood. Um, thus concludes my, my overview of the book, uh, and I'm going to turn now to um, Father Brandon Gallagher for his comments. Um, th thank you, Taylor. Um, thank you, um, Jordan. Um, it's rare to find a book that sets out a new approach uh, for contemporary theology, especially in a doctoral monograph, and one in which is a work of historical theology. But such, I believe, is uh, Wood's whole mystery of Christ. Now, why do I make uh, this un un unapologetically hy hyperbolic claim? 
much Christian theology throughout its history, and here I think of modern Orthodox theology in particular, from Florovsky and Lossky to Zazulis, has taken the uncreated created distinction as a sort of ultimate grammatical theological rule and often used it as a truncheon to beat others with. And so one here uh, thinks, of course, of everything from uh, the human being who is not God, so a distinction between that which is creaturely and that which is uh, God or the uncreated, to, of course, a Christology itself, which is a union of the uncreated and the created. But um, with as any rule that you're going to deal with, any distinction, it depends how you use it whether you do so with creativity or as a brutal limit to maintain orthodoxy. What Wood reminds us is, is the uncreated created distinction, while certainly basic, cannot come to stand in some sense um, sort of uh, prior to God as a sort of, to borrow a phrase from a friend, calculus of the infinite, which God must follow or else it cannot, if we are to take the fact that God is with us in Jesus Christ, the incarnation, with absolute seriousness, and with it our deification, our gracious adoption as sons of God in the Son of God, the uncreated created distinction in Christ cannot be read as a sort of absolute dualism or polarity. If in Christ we have, following Maximus, a supernatural birth from on high, um, in grace, taking on divinity to the same degree that the word of God willed to empty himself in the incarnation of his own unmixed glory in being reckoned and truly becoming human. Or, as Wood notes, the tantum quantum principle prescribes that to the same degree that God becomes man in the historical incarnation, we become God in deification. But what is the motor of this simultaneous uh, assumption and sublation of the uncreated created distinction and deification? And here he is out hegeling Hegel. And indeed, um, here one is what he calls creation as incarnation. He traces this in Maximus's crystal logic that was just mentioned by Taylor. And um, of how precisely the one logos is many logi and vice versa. Yet there are many ways of doing this in theological history. One thinks, of course, of Bulgakov and his sophiology of the divine and the creaturely Sophias. And as Bulgakov wrote, um, for uh, humanity is called to become God manhood, which is the primordial uh, foundation of creation. Or for a more ancient text uh, in the Gospel of Thomas where it says, Jesus said, it is I who am the light which is above them all. It is I who am the all. From me did the all come forth, and unto me did the all extend. Split a piece of wood, and I am there. Lift up the stone, and you will find me there. What I want to zero in on is the hinge or the theological mechanism by which one can say that God is not only with us in the historical incarnation, but also in creation through the Logi understood as the body of God, or as Wood puts it, that the world is literally Christ's body is the deepest ground for Maximus's bold and consistent insistence on the God world reciprocity. Quoting Maximus, the world above uh, will again be filled with the members of the body being gathered together with their head, filling the body of him who fills all in all, which fills and is filled from all things. What Maximus seems to uh, hold is that the whole mystery of Christ, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection on the third day, the ascension into heaven, the sitting at the right hand, and the second and glorious coming, are taken up into the life of God and become retroactively the causes of all things that exist in the world, the principles of creation itself, to quote Maximus. The mystery of the, of the words incarnation bears the power of all enigmas and types according to scripture, as well as the science of all created things sensible and intelligible. 
And whoever knows the mystery of the cross and tomb knows the logi of these created beings just mentioned. And whoever is initiated into the ineffable power of the resurrection knows the principal purpose for which God gave hypostasis to all things. The events of Jesus' life then are the causes which actualize the universal principles as logi of every age and creature. And this is because Christ is incarnate in creation, in the, in the very Logi themselves. Uh, if we gaze into the life of things from a stone to an angel, you will see the face of the crucified savior, the bridegroom staring back out at you. Would traces the crystal logic seen in the historical incarnation and creation in the uh, Logi, in the four principles which Taylor mentioned? He then argues that um, this is they were able to obtain because Christ is not a genus, nor is he an individual. He is a particular precisely as a universal. And Christ is exceptional, uh, he argues, precisely because he can be both universal and particular in his own person. And he is exceptional because he can be freely repeatable in a non-formal way in and as all creation. So in conclusion, only by being with us, Jesus Christ, as a universal particular, as Sartre called it, a singular universal, can God save us or preserve us. He is in all things and is all things to redeem and deify us. This sort of theology is ever an ancient and ever new. In re-envisioning the uncreated created distinction, it speaks to a world alienated from God, calling it back, as Alexander Schmemann said, to the mysterious glory which penetrates our worship, the manifestation of God, but also of the world, such as God created it, of the divine roots of creation, destined to be filled with God, that God may be in it as all in all. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon. Um, I'd like to now pass it over to Dr. Aristotle Papanikolaou. Thank you all. Thank you for organizing this um, as a center. Um, and speaking on behalf of my colleague, uh, Georgie Makopoulos, who's also the co-founding director, uh, we're very honored and privileged to be doing this. And uh, the fact that we have <laughs> over 200 people registered um, has perhaps that sparked another idea that maybe more people want uh, these kinds of webinars and discussions on, on books, on theology, uh, which is actually a really good sign. But it also is a testimony to your book, Jordan, of course. And, um, you know, I, I contacted you before your dissertation was done, I think, uh, for the Modern Theology article that you wrote. And, you know, I have to kind of start there. I know uh, maybe this has nothing to do with the book, but um, when I read your article and then I've read this again, this book, I just, uh, only because, you know, I, 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 you know, I started my work on him and he's probably the most famous Orthodox theologian of the past century is that it just seems to me to vindicate um, Zulus's impulses, I would say. Um, you definitely are more thorough, more nuanced, go well beyond him, right? But uh, the, what I tried to argue anyway with him um, is that he saw something in that category that no one else quite unpacked. Um, and, and it makes sense because I think, you know, there's this defining moment of, you know, who do, we, you know, as, as my, you know, good friend, Father John, the question that Father John Bear always kind of lifts up for us, who do you say that I am? And that question, you know, uh, being discerned uh, over centuries was, was answered in such a way that somehow if the simplicity of God is such that it doesn't allow for a communion with God, then that's just not what simplicity means or should mean, <laughs> right? And, you know, there was a sense in which, uh, a, you know, a growing sense in which essential language, language of essence, substance, isn't going to make sense of this. And somehow, you know, uh, somewhat organically emerges this hypothesis this word, this category. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, to some extent, I just, I do want to lift that out because I think that, um, 
you know, Zizilus was criticized uh, for not exactly reflecting what the Cappadocians say, for the systematic nature of theology, uh, which again, Father John and I have had discussions for the past 22 years over many beers uh, about that. Um, and maybe we can discuss that. That's maybe one of the reasons why I'm bringing Zizilus in too is, you know, what's going on with Maximus? Is there a kind there, it's, it seems very systematic to me. Right, uh, and maybe we can discuss what that means in terms of coherence, or just thinking about the kinds of uh, philosophical or even sort of theological logics, let's say, that's governing what he's doing. But uh, yeah, I guess I just want to first lift that out in some sense that that what you're doing is uh, obviously a much expanded and fleshed out version. I think of what Zizulus's impulses were. Um, there are some differences. I mean, I think he focuses on a relational notion of hypotheses where I don't necessarily see that in your work. But the other thing, though, that I find interesting, two other really quick points, because I think we should get to the discussion. We have a lot of people online. And I think they want to ask questions. I guess um, it just seems, though, that you do mimic what he and Lasky do in terms of creating this sort of antinomy between hypothesis and nature. And I, it's not clear to me the good work that nature is doing in your, and maybe it's Maximus's fault, right? I mean, so maybe we need to correct Maximus, but it seems that, and I know, and I say this comment, you're probably thinking to yourself, oh, but wait, I'm page so-and-so, I'm page so-and-so, I'm page so-and-so, I say this and that, right? And yet, I don't, I, I still don't quite know, it's not clear to me the role it plays um in deification it seems like it does have to be overcome um it seems maybe that you know ludovicus's critique of zizulus is this kind of uh um eschatological um brandon you remember the title of that article i mean the, the eschatological determinism of some sorts uh somehow uh almost a forced kind of personhood um sort of an imposed kind of grace on nature um so maybe we can talk about that a little bit and just that that can be a little bit uh, clarified um there's you know you have i mean there's all kinds of quotes i can have here but you have statements like uh, hypothesis is indifference to nature i don't think you really mean indifference in the sense like i don't care what nature i have but i think obviously it's a more technical philosophical term uh philosophical resonance to it which maybe we can unpack a little bit more but i almost do feel like it borderlines a little bit on the Hypothesis is such that basically any persons of the Trinity could have become incarnate. I know that's not your argument. I know that's not your argument. Um, but it just seems that the relationship you have between the two is one that almost mimics what Lasky and Zizulis are have, especially with this idea of the inevitability and the fall, which places such an emphasis on the finitude uh, of creation itself. So maybe we can talk about that, the work it kind of does. Um, it's hard to me to think that the only work it does is to distinguish us from God, um, which it sounds like that's what it's doing in your book. And then finally, just again, this, this you're, you know, you, you, you're doing this patristic work, but yet you're somehow schooled in German idealism and you're seeing some of the contemporary implications of this. I mean, again, I mean, you know, just this, um, this idea of like, what's going on here? Is this systematic theology or isn't it? Um, I mean, I'm here to kind of talk a little bit about the implications for systematic theology, but there are some who would argue that that shouldn't apply to someone like Maximus, right? Don't use that. Uh, I think, you know, Louis Ayers would be rolling his eyes now because, I mean, he wouldn't, uh, you know, he wouldn't want to use that language, uh, so to speak. So, but I, I see this, uh, uh, I see a lot of systematic theology going on here. Um, and it's it's just well beyond simply you know interpretation of scriptures, um, so maybe we can you know throw that into it. so three things just to kind of throw in there as ways of sparking some interest and some discussion and but uh, and constructively I think substantively maybe the the real the my real question is the uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more on nature, so thanks Tally. I'd like to now pass it over um, to Father John Baer for his response. Thanks, Taylor. <clears throat> and um, thanks, Jordan. Thanks for the invitation for doing this. This is, I think, the third time I've read this book. Actually, I should say the work. I still don't have a copy of the book, but <laughs> never mind. 
Um, I think the first time I read it, I just finished my work on Origins on First Principles. Then the second time I read it is when you asked me to write a foreword, and I just finished my book on the Gospel of John. And then reading it again today, having just finished work on Gregory, it's been really fascinating interacting with your work whilst doing all of these different works. So it's kind of, kind of a kind of dialogue that's been going on with all of that. Um, what I really, really like about your work is that you take Maximus at his word. As simple as that. Yeah, you, you take him on his own terms, you try and expand him on his own terms and take him seriously for what he says. And that you're grounding this in Christology, Christologic, like Taylor was talking about. That the one hypothesis of both divinity and humanity, of uncreated reality and created reality, the one Christ. The way that that hypostatic identity generates infinite, yet perichoretic, natural differences, all kind of things you've done. That moves so far beyond the usual picture of, of post-Chalcedonian, neo-Chalcedonian asymmetrical Christology, where you have a divine hypostasis, you know, again, already a category mistake, and hypostasizing human nature into a divine person with all the quandaries that that then rises, you know, is he truly human, all of those kind of things. No, you're very, very clear. He's both, and as hypostasis, he transcends both, both divinity and humanity, with the quotation you finish your conclusion with. And then you take that into the Christologic of creation, protology, eschatology, which is just such an illuminating discussion of all of that, much more so than anything else I've ever read on Maximus with regard to that, and again, interacting with Origen and Gregory and so on. Um, the question of the fall, the question of phenomenology, the phenomenality of all these kind of things, the different points of origin, uh, and all of that kind of thing. However, coming back to it again, I've got at least four questions that I'm going to ask, if not five, depending on how many you let me have. So firstly, does Maximus actually differentiate the terms that he uses for incarnation? You just use incarnation. As far as I'm aware, he uses ensarcosis, ensomatosis, becoming thick, and quite often translators of Maximus simply translate the word economia as incarnation. Yeah, there's a very big difference between those terms. You can't just render them all as incarnation, which presumes we know what incarnation means. Yeah, so ensarcosis and ensomatosis are the, the two key ones. One meaning embodiment, and one meaning enfleshment. Yeah, and we might just naively think that flesh is body, body is flesh, the two are incidental and whatever, but that's really not the case. Yeah, you know, there's a difference in Greek between sarx and kriya. Sarx is prepared meat, yeah, <laughs> meat that meat that's been cooked. Yeah, in, in, in um, Exodus twelve, it, you know, it, it, it's prepared meat. It's not just simply. So they're, they're different nuances. And as I'm reading earlier files, especially Origen and Gregory for that matter, it's really interesting to watch how the different words are played out. Um, so on one hand, that does, does he actually? different as far as you've discerned with that. And secondly, you talk about how Maximus, rightly, you talk about how Maximus moves seamlessly between the words incarnation in the world and in Mary, just one, one from the other, without, you say, without the slightest proviso, yeah? And that's most explicit in the passage where he talks about this world being a womb and he immediately juxtaposes it to the womb of Mary, the womb of Elizabeth, and, you know, the, the whole thing, just one to the other. So the question then is, does Maximus qualify the incarnation of Jesus in Mary by any differentiating word? Because you do, repeatedly. You still, you, I mean, you still, you, you, you repeatedly talk about the historic incarnation, which seems to make it different from any other incarnation. Yeah, so does Maximus himself do that? Do, do, and how, how would he do that? Does he do that? Or is it so seamlessly that maybe we even need to take a further step back from how we're using the word incarnation and just think in, in much, much more dramatic ways? The third question. Uh, again, the, actually, all these questions are variations on the same theme. So you could probably answer with just one word, but, but that's fine. Um, the third question is one that's been bothering me ever more recently, and that would be, are the names Jesus and Christ simply interchangeable or fully interchangeable? 
Now, of course, there's only one subject. There's only one hypothesis. We all know that. Communicatio idiomatum, how you speak in one respect, you speak about it in another respect, and so on. But strikingly, you very rarely talk about Jesus in this book. Very rarely. Uh, that reflects Maximus. I think one of the few places I found was on, on page 90. You're talking about this mystery is for Maximus, the ineffable, quoting him, the ineffable and incomprehensible union according to hypotheses of divinity and humanity that brings created and uncreated natures into perfect identity. And then you're gloss on that. In this very identity, the one wrought in history from the conception in Mary's womb to cross, to resurrection, to ascension, every being, and not just the man Jesus, receives its beginning and end. So what's going on in that, in, in that language? Yeah, wait, wait, not just the man Jesus. Where does a man Jesus fit into all of this? And I can't help wondering, you know, again, of course there's only one subject and of course communicatio idiomatum, but in fact, there's something more going on in the language. So you talk, um, you, you emphasize how Maximus is very Pauline in what he's doing with the body of Christ. Yeah, so we could talk about the church is the body of Christ. We all become the body of Christ, individually, collectively, and so on. In a way, you would never say, substitute the word Jesus. Do we become the, do we become the body of Jesus? How does that then play into the understanding of incarnation in the different modalities that you'd want to speak about? We become the body of Christ. Christ is incarnate in all the great mystery of Christ. Where does Jesus fit into the mystery of Christ? I'm going to put it really provocatively like that. Um, fourth question. Again, it's kind of a play in the same realm of themes. Maximus also talks about the word becoming thick in Scripture. Yeah, or even incarnate in scripture, always becomes flesh in scripture. Where would that fit into your picture? I mean, that's not your concern in this book, and that's fine. Creation is incarnation. Where would scripture fit into that as a, a third thickening of the word? Yeah, and how would that correlate to creation? I don't know. I'm simply I don't know, asking that one. And then finally, another thing which has become intriguing to me, and it's not one you touch on, it's one that kind of Telly briefly kind of alluded to, um, and that's the generation of the Son. You talk about the hypothesis of the one Christ, the one hypothesis generated from the Father. Is that generation of the Son for Maximus simply a unidirectional movement? The Father begets the Son, therefore, the son would be the passive outcome of the father's activity. I'm really struck by the way Origen and Gregory of Nyssa in some ways, but Origen especially, talks about the son drawing divinity into himself to administer it to us. Yeah, and, and that kind of language, um, which makes it active as well. So uh, Telly mentioned about German idealism. It's almost like the self-positing of the I. Yeah, so it's active. As, so it's not just a, a the, the passive outcome of an action from the father resulting in the hypothesis of the son, but something more perhaps is going on than that. Okay, um, those are four dense questions, and I, or five dense questions. Um, but again, really, really appreciate the book, and it's been so fertile for me to think through as I've been working through with thinkers prior to Maximus. Thank you. Thanks, Father John. Um, Jordan, at this point, I'd like to pass it over to you uh, to sort of respond to your respondents, and then we can uh, broaden the discussion from there. Thank you. <clears throat> I gotta apologize, I have a little cold, but we'll see what we can do here. Um, I'm just really honored and grateful to all of you for being here, <clears throat> for the, to the panelists especially, and to Taylor and Justin for organizing this into the center, for organizing it and hosting it. Um, I, it's really flattering. I don't know really what to say. It's, it's like, um, you don't really write these things usually, you know, like those of us that, you know, we're, we like, we have families, we interact with normal people. <laughs> they don't really care what you do a lot of the times. And so they don't really care to hear all the details and stuff. So especially where I'm at right now, I don't have that interaction a whole lot. So this is a huge blessing for me. And I just, I'm really grateful. I don't, I don't know how else to put it. <clears throat> So I'm going to briefly 
partly because of the voice, but but also because I do also, like Telly said, I want to get to some of the uh, people online that are here that have given their time to this today. But I want I do want to touch on a little bit, kind of throw in a little interaction with each of the panelists, and then maybe we can move on. Perhaps we can develop some of the issues that uh, other people are more interested in, um, you know, uh, more directly than than some others. So, Father Brandon, <clears throat> I think puts his, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Your summary of the book is much better than the book I wrote. I think uh, it was, <laughs> it was, it was beautiful. Um, I, yeah, and uh, and I think though that you put your finger on really what the crucial thing is. It's the thing I try to end with in the conclusion as well, which is that an abstract distinction. And I say abstract in the sense of not yet keyed to any particular determination, say of God's act or or uh, of human acts in history. So that's what I mean by abstract here. It's not that it's bad. It's just it just is abstract. So the abstract distinction between creator and creature has very often, especially in narratives of patristic Christology or theology broadly, been kind of that hinge, you know, in 325, we finally fix the unbridgeable chasm between God and the world, and we finally get the sun, at least, with the Holy Spirit soon to follow, right, on the other side of the chasm, and that is, in fact, in one book in particular, I think I cite, that is, in fact, the, the quote, Christian difference or distinction. A very, very well-known book uh, makes an argument. I don't think it's unique to that book. I think it's actually pretty common. As you, as you said, right, the grammar, we assume this is the grammar of Christian theology, and it's kind of like obvious, therefore not much needs to be said. I have always, as I say in the conclusion, I, I have always found that a little bit odd since, since as I say, I think there putting, fixing the sun, as it were, to put it crudely, on the other side of the chasm has the simultaneous effect of fixing that part of the chasm right here on this side in the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you put the sun over there, you make him consubstantial with the Father. The one who is consubstantial, and Chalcedon sort of trots this out a little bit further, more clearly perhaps, though still much more to develop, that same one who's consubstantial, the Father is also consubstantial with us. So, so you can't really fix a chasm without simultaneously seeing some kind of bridge there. And I would, of course, argue that the very act of God and, and an ecstatic condescension in the incarnation to in the person of the word bridge the chasm is what even allowed us to think of it at all. And so we we need we it's easy to kind of begin with the creator creature distinction, <clears throat> and then move within it as if that's the ultimate horizon. But really, I do think, and I think it's clear in Maximus and prior writers that really it was exactly sort of the inverse. It wasn't until you beheld the God Man, until you had disputes about theendric activity, until you, you know, tried to decide what it means to say in in the in the liturgy, right? One of the Trinity suffered and died. That's when you're, you're thinking through the identity you're presuming of the subject, Jesus Christ, and, and then you're abstracting about what does this mean for his two natures, or should we even say two natures, or et cetera. So I think you're exactly right to pinpoint that that was, that was an intuition that was guiding me throughout, and Maximus really taught me, I think, uh, which was um, beginning with, and that's that, that fourth element I have of Christologic that Taylor alluded to, that's what I was getting at there, that the event itself yeah, I'm not going to define it further yet, but the event discloses its own logic. Um, it's not like someone was sitting around figuring out and coming up with the incarnation abstractly. You know, you had to see uh, the man, behold the man right on the cross, suffering, died, buried, resurrected, ascended. And then you, you see him in his body. So I think I, I just, I don't have a whole lot to say, except uh, I'm really interested in, in future, hopefully, conversations with you, Father Brandon, to discuss the, how does this interact with sociology, right, with Bogakov. Um, I've, I've been recently been rereading Lamb of God, and I find quite a lot of convergences. There are certainly divergences and differences and perhaps tensions. But I do think fundamentally there's the same sort of impulse there. I mean, we talked about Zazulis, but I also think Bogakov is, is there too. I mean, it's Bogakov, by the way, I'm sort of getting to Tally's um, this point now. It's Bogakov, by the way, who says that even in Leontius of Byzantium, you have, quote, the beginnings of personalism. Bogakov says that, you know. Um, but no one's claiming you got a full-blown personalist philosophy, right, in the 6th and 7th century. I don't even really think Zulus is in, in his better moments, but that, that would be uh, something for someone else to talk about. So anyway, thank you, Father Brandon. I appreciate it. We can maybe pick up some of the threads um, as we go. Uh, on to uh, uh, 
Telly's three great uh, points and questions. I also try to focus more on the second one since that's what he sort of emphasized. I just I just wanted to briefly note then uh, related to what I just said that yeah I, I, well, I remember when you emailed me Telly <laughs> early on I was like wow what's going on here and you're like I think you said something about how you sent the article to to a to a Zulus. I was like oh my goodness I'm now I'm embarrassed right what, what's going to happen but um, I. I have to say this just because it might be interesting to some people. I had not really ever read even a full book by Zazulis when I started my dissertation on Maximus. So it really wasn't like I was going to Maximus with it. The same is true with Hegel, by the way, but you know, <laughs> not everybody believes me. But I hadn't really read these guys. I had really only read you know, Origin extensively, Gregory Nisa. I read some Berdayev and so on. But um <clears throat> And so it was striking when I went back through being as communion. Um, I don't know. I, some of the moves there, I think he, he flags Maximus all the time, as you well know. And I, 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 so I'm just agreeing with you on that first point that I do think that the intuitions there are Maximian. And perhaps he, I, you'd have to tell us why he felt the need to place it so strongly in the fourth century, like the development, the key developments. Um, and I think others works like Zach Hoover's recently historically, but then people that have commented on Zizulis rightly see, well, sure, you don't have to find the fundamental developments in the fourth century necessarily the way Zizulis sometimes claimed, but that they occurred at all, I don't think is really be, uh, in dispute or really can be disputed, perhaps I should say. And I do think they find their, their uh, decisive or at least most clear glitterings, right, uh, in the sixth and seventh century developments, post-Chalcedon, Neo-Chalcedonian Christology. So I agree with you there. Let's focus on the second one, though, <laughs> the antinomy of uh, nature and hypothesis. And this actually will relate to some of the things Father John brought up. So I'll, I'll kind of you know, shoehorn some of this in. <clears throat> one of the great risks I took, I think, in the first chapter is to write what almost probably feels like a scholastic, <laughs> highly schematized, very rigidly abstract, a sort of arid presentation of what I called the crystal logic. And I really do mean logic there in, a, in an, the intuitive sense of the intelligible structure and relations within that structure of intelligibility of the Christ of, event, of, of the incarnation. Now, the, I, I do think there's a clearly merit to do that with Maximus. I mean, as I often say, um, you know, works by the 7th and 8th century, a lot of his works were circulating with uh, commentaries on Porphyry's Isagoge, uh, some of which uh, some people have speculated were written by Maximus himself, almost as if to say, you're not going to understand some of the stuff this guy says, unless you understand not only Aristotelian logic and the organon, but also the developments of Neoplatonic logic. Um, and so you need to look at this tree, right, and so forth, and, and see the relations. And I think that's, that's that wasn't haphazard. Um, but the risk there that I took, and I do think has been even by some rather eminent uh, um, readers of the work, um, misread, is that just because you have to begin somewhere, that, 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 that the way it appears to you, that starting point, the way it appears to you must, must continue to persist as it initially appeared to you. It's super abstract. But what I mean is this. I do think it's crucial to distinguish between nature and hypostasis as distinct logics, as I, as I say there in, the, in there, and then to fully think out the implications of what that distinction means. But that can't replace another second moment, which was how, how would you relate them anew? That is kind of what I tried to subtly do, especially in chapter three and four, because when, really what, you're at, what, what I think we're asking when we ask, how, do nat how does nature and hypothesis relate, you're asking about reality, like in existence, or what I think Maximus would say, that which you can only know by experience, direct, immediate experience. Because nature and hypothesis don't actually exist together, uh, or don't exist together abstractly. That's the point of distinguishing them as logics. They only ever exist as life, as actuality, as determinate. It's not, you know, so I don't, I don't, as I like to say now, because I think it's been misread, I don't think, for example, that there is a principle, an abstract principle of hypostasis, which can neatly sort of um, resolve all of our conundrums and all the dualities that, that plague, you know, philosophical and theological thinking from, from the dawn of time. I don't think there is such a thing as a, an abstract hypostasis. 
But I do think there's some use in the moment of abstracting what a hypothesis is as distinct from nature. So I think, in other words, that seeing the moments come and go is one thing, seeing actually uh, the, the way the discussion unfolded in history and in tradition itself. But the other thing it is, is it's seeing the moments which make up the relations, the intelligible apprehension of the, of the truth itself. And that just because, and they don't have to arise in a certain order either. I don't, I'm not committed to that. I don't think there's one absolute starting point to thinking through and contemplating the mystery of Christ. Um, <clears throat> it's just that um, we have to see that because if we don't see that their initial abstract distinction, when we later encounter things, and I'm a little bit previewing what I'll say to, to Father Bear, Father John, uh, um, when we later encounter, say, Maximus speaking uh, positively of nature, as we do on occasion, right? I mean, to act according to your logos, your principle of nature is, is the thing that you know, leads to deification. He does often say that we, uh, well, he says grace is sown into all things by nature. Even the Holy Spirit is in all things by nature, um, <clears throat> by virtue of their natus, right? By virtue of their birth or generation, origination. Um, that's a different sense of nature. And I don't know if I was as clear about that because in the first chapter, I'm so right, laser focused on the Christological distinction between nature and person. But you do bring them back together and there can be something in you that's technically by nature, but it isn't necessarily the uh, something that completes your essence. Uh, often people think of accidents this way, substantial accidents. There's something you acquire, which does seem to make up, make you who you are, which doesn't nevertheless make up the part of the definition, the abstract definition of humanity that you bear. Actually, Thomas Aquinas does make that distinction, <laughs> to, to speak positively of Thomas for, for a second. He does make that distinction about uh, in nature. There's something that can be in, uh, something by nature as a formal power of its perfection, like of its essence, but also it can be there as uh, something by virtue of its origination. And I think that often gets alighted. So I have no problem, for example, saying that when we investigate, say, phenomenologically, the human being, you will find already the potential for deification, right? In, a, in an actual human being, I mean, not, I'm not abstracting anymore. I mean, anybody you know, and in yourself, and any spirit you encounter, right? But that's because the word of God is already in them as the very principle of their nature. So even the principle of nature is personal because that is a person, the son of God, who is, who is the Logi. So um, he doesn't decline himself formally, right, to become that. He still is himself even through the dissension. So, um, so that's where I think, so you have two things in Maximus. It discusses a little bit, I think, in, in both chapters three and four. For you'll have you will have moments where he'll say, for example, the ascetic struggle for to acquire virtue is quote right uh, against nature. But you also have the sense that well, also if you live according to your logos on the way to deification, that's that's in accordance with nature, right? And I think unless he's just being totally, you know, contradictory, um, we have to distinguish the resonance or the sort of um, um, you know the kind of the. Uh, the senses of nature there. The first, when you work against nature in order to become deified, it's not because you're a person and person has to suppress nature in order to be itself. That would mean there's a tension and there would be no indifference like I want to insist upon. Instead, what it means is insofar as you reduce your person to what you apprehend in your nature, then now nature has become an occasion for you to suppress your own self or the selves of others. So it's about the judgment made about nature and its relation to person, not something in themselves, which are which is intention. But, but, but if I can just interject, yeah. I know you're with Father John, but I mean, the you you touch on the virtue thing in chapter three, and I think that's the part that is a key to understanding what what, what the na the role of nature in Maximus, because yeah. the virtue and the it's it's virtue has something to do with realignment of the soul, mm -hmm. parts of the soul, mm -hmm. yeah, but that's common to everyone, right. Right, uh, even though it's instantiated, embodied in very particular ways, right, in very unique, irreducibly unique ways, but that's common to everybody. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's absolutely no question that deification is uh, described for him in terms of virtue. Yeah, because it's actually described in terms of love, mm -hmm. and and you know that when in union with God, the 
you know, rational cognitive capacity. It's not that it stops, just that it's so saturated that it can't, you know, it's, it's not a thing, right? right. Not a thing. So all that remains is arrows. Right. So that, that, that means that ultimately there's a kind of realignment of the soul as, 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 as a way of making sense of what exactly deification is. Yeah. Because it's love. Right? Yes. Yes. So it's, uh, there's something I think more has to be said about um, nature, I think. I think, I think there's, there's something else, there's something much more positive about what nature is capable of. And, and man, you, you do mention that you kind of point to it, but I think, I, I think that that part can be much more expanded. And then there's a, there's a Bogakovian point and we have time, I'll, I'll make it, but I, I don't want, you should, yeah. you need to respond to Father John and we can go on, so. Yeah, I know, thank you. Yeah, no, just one quick point to that. Like, I, I think that the thing about love is that it can't be, uh, it has to be determinate, it's object, right? No one loves anything abstractly. And so what's tough is when you try to combine that with the sort of apophatic move of like God's transcendence, which seems to make him the most indeterminate object, right? Precisely because the horizon always is ever receding, which is what elicits your desire. But of course, there is no rest for the desire of their erotic desire, except exactly in a particular, most determinate, non-formal object, but yet positive. Otherwise, otherwise it's just an empty vacuum. And so one way I would put it, I did not put it in the book, and I think you're right, this could really help a little, is that I do view that, I view nature understood formally as something like an initial salvo or a caress, if you put it that way, of the infinite trinity, like a deposit in us, which is already formally orienting us towards the only actual infinite determinate object of love, which is the Trinity. Um, and yet the way it initially appears phenomenologically to us that we can abstract about it, et cetera, the way it initially appears to us is nothing but a promise for, the, for that perfection, right? Which will not look formal. And that's the, that's the kind of ambiguity of nature considered as such. But, Anyway, I think you're right. Yeah, there's, and it's important to know as well. Here's something you're saying. When Ma Max, you turns, Maximus, as you well know, and Megium Ma 7 turns to virtue as another way to understand the Logi doctrine, right? He, he steps back at one point after all these like metaphysical stuff and metaphysics of nature or motion. And he says, well, here's another way to think of this. We all agree, right, that, that virtue, acquiring virtue is, um, is something we need to do, but we also know that you know, Jesus Christ is the essence of virtue. So when you become virtue, virtuous, it's not just that you're acquiring something that's already there, self-subsistent. It's that the thing you're acquiring is descending into you and, and taking on your subsistence. Um, and that's that that thing, of course, isn't a thing. It's a person, it's Christ. So anyway, there's a lot there. I think you're right to point to it as a, as a fertile direction. All right, finally to <laughs> Father John's uh, uh, questions i'll try to glide over these as best i can uh because you you asked the hard 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 questions here. uh to the first i'll just say uh does maximus differentiate differentiate the terms of incarnation like embodiment and fleshment <clears throat> i'd have to look at that i mean he certainly uses the different uh terms that you used um i i need to do more study to see whether or not i see a consistent pattern systematically and consistently carried out through his works that would give them sort of like distinct connotations or even denotations. Uh, one thing that does come to mind, though, is a distinction he makes between kenosis and um, uh, kenosis and um, uh, condescension. And one thing we, we we have to keep in mind is that like becoming flesh, right? And I know there's another way to run this, but I'm going to stick with what I know with him. Becoming flesh isn't just uh, again abstract. It's becoming the flesh which has fallen. It's endemic flesh. So the incarnation is already a response to embodiment that's failed. There is a sense in which the soma, the fully ensouled and really spiritualized flesh of like, say, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, that's, uh, as you well know, better than most, is an origin in Gregory. And the Maximus picks up from that line, um, is, is only for the first time realized say, in the resurrection and ascension. Um, and that everything that preceded it, though, isn't something how in discontinuity or disjunction, but it was flesh. He became flesh. But the flesh he became was the flesh which he received from, from, from the mother and from us through her, right? Which isn't perfected yet. And so I would wonder if there's a way to correlate his distinction. He says, by the way, kenosis is him taking on 
the consequences of sin in his flesh, whereas condescension is him taking on the essence of humanity, like simpliciter. So I wonder if there would be, if that, that those sorts of distinctions would, would affect the, uh, the terminology, but I, I don't know off the top of my head enough to say with confidence. Second question was um, about moving seamlessly. Does, does Maxus ever qualify, say, the incarnation in Mary? And, and kind of my use, my constant use, right, of historical incarnation. Here I do want to repair back a little bit to uh, my emphasis earlier on seeing the moments. It's not that I think the sequence is absolute from one insight to the next, to the next moment, etc. It's that I think we, where we are, need to see how it unfolded before we can see the whole. That's why the fourth chapter is the whole. The first chapter is the middle, right? Second chapter is the beginning. Third's the end. Fourth is the whole because the whole can't be, the whole of a sequence can't itself be perceived uh, but sequentially, but it doesn't mean that the logic of the whole is sequential. See what I mean? So, so what, what I want to say is I want to emphasize the historical incarnation because I do think there's a, there's a spot where no one's going to dispute that this is an incarnation, right? So since I am poised against my interlocutors who constantly qualify or sort of put in quotation marks, these other incarnations, or they'll say, well, the historical incarnation is like the real deal. And then the cosmic stuff is just a nice, it's a nice metaphor for, for, for eminence and all things. I wanted to begin and I want to constantly refer back to the place where no one disputes that this was the incarnation of the Son of God. Now, what I want to do, hopefully, through thinking through the implications, the sequence is to see that that actually that incarnation doesn't stop there around 3033, right? It is, in fact, not only will it continue to, to take the, the entire cosmos, that's the scope, but it's actually already been simultaneously in relation to uh, the beginning and the middle and all the moments and the end and the whole. And so uh, I wanted to, I do wanted to em emphasize historical incarnation for that kind of strategic purpose, number one. But I also think there's a second point I want to make here. So like in question 60, it's very clear that he's speaking about, and that's why I use the word Jesus, by the way, to go to the next question. There, it's clear that he's speaking about right, first century Palestinian Jew, born of a woman uh, named Mary, right? And I think it's important to see that, and, and this is, I end in my conclusion this way as well, we don't need in the end to choose between the particular and the universal. We don't need in the end to choose between the historical and the cosmic. We don't need in the end to choose between the generic or abstract and the singular right, person. Part of the impulse of the whole thing is to say, we can fully say with total integrity and with a clear voice all the moments as they are. Not because that takes away from the, the role and the fact that they're moments of the whole, but precisely because the whole doesn't need to squash any of its moments in order to be what it is and who it is. So I don't mind saying historical incarnation because I don't, I don't think that negates any, it's not in opposition ultimately, say, to a cosmic incarnation or to incarnation in Mary or to incarnation in the principles of all things in this world, which is like a womb, you know, or, you know, so... So <clears throat> it actually frees us to speak clearly about the moments precisely because the moments aren't in any competition at all with the whole. So, so I think that that point, um, I would want to, you know, maybe put that out there. But number three was um, Christ Jesus, Christ and Jesus. Uh, I think you're right that it reflects Maximus's preference for Christ. Why would he prefer that? That's an interesting question. There is the, there is the um, right, because you still have in Chalcedon, you have the Lord, one Lord Jesus Christ. It's not like Jesus wasn't there or something. Um, I think, I don't, I have some speculations as to why he would prefer Christ, but I actually want to sidestep that for now and say, one thing that's very clear is when he, one effect of him using Christ so much is that when he uses Jesus, it stands out very much like Origins homilies when he speaks of my Jesus right? My Jesus. It's very personal. One point I try to make in the fourth chapter is that we have to, again, overcome the opposition of, say, my personal private sin, or like in this time and place, and say the fall of all humanity. And what I think is most interesting is when Maximus changes to that extremely intimate personal address, my Jesus. But he, at the same time, especially in question 61, he at the same time says that my fault my fault, you know, in view of my Jesus, brought down human nature, all of human nature, right, and subjected to the necessity of nature. 
Um, <clears throat> and so I, I don't know the ultimate question of why he would prefer Christ all the time, but I do think the origin and origin sort of rhetorical move of using Christ, not just I mean, using Jesus, not just rhetorical, but the intimate, the interpersonal, the direct by experience that he often emphasizes pops more as it were, it stands off more. And it links to what we would normally consider the personal dimension of existence with say the cosmic or universal one in such a way that even that is a seamless right, garment. So I don't know, there's much more to say there and I have to think more about it, it's a great question. Number four, quickly, uh, what about scripture? Well, yeah, <laughs> um, I don't personally see a whole lot of difference between Maximus and Origen on scripture and their approach to it and their conception of it as, as, a, 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 as a dimension of the one incarnation in all things. Um, so he can as well as Origen does speak of the world right the, the the cosmos of the scripture but the co right cosmos is also uh the scripture of nature right and, and he says in ambiguo in like 10 this is because the one word right wears the garments of both the inner and the outer garments which are illumined to the transfigured light so i don't i don't uh there's more to say there for sure and i would really want to rope in the way he actually per, uh, interprets scripture as a, as an illuminative of um of his approach to scripture but i i don't know if we have time for that at this this point lastly um is the sun's generation unidirectional passive so maximus really consistently appropriates if you will um the the uh, the roles of the eight of the agents in both creation and incarnation, and he often likes to say that the father wills, right? Say creation or incarnation. The son executes in himself, realizes or actualizes in himself, and the Holy Spirit culminates or perfects, or later Ariugenolad distributes. Um, and. I actually think that the logic of the incarnation has something to do with what initially looks like a passivity um, connected to the gener eternal generation, but also in the generation or the birth from the mother. Um, but I don't think it is ultimately simply, you know, in fact, one of the things I had planned was a section on Mary <laughs> uh, in the book, because I find it especially fascinating in Ambiguum 5, that the, that the, the Christ's communi the communication of idioms that happens between Christ's natures, the perichoresis of the modes, et cetera, actually happens simultaneously with that same perichoresis running, uh, uh, occurring in Mary, right? Because she's the virgin and the mother. So when he becomes the son of God and the son of man, he simultaneously makes her, right, virgin and mother. But because she's virgin and mother, of course, that's why he is son of God and son of man. So there's a sort of entanglement of the perichoresis, if you want to put it that way, um, that happens even between those two. I couldn't, I couldn't justify the word limit was getting too far and so on. But um, <clears throat> so I, I want to say um, it's not so much about passivity, but about active relation between the two and the entanglements of various uh, uh, sym symmetries and identity, that which began between the mother and her son. Uh, and, and simultaneously, though, so I shouldn't say really began, but simultaneously with the father and his son. Right. So, so Chalcedon's symmetry. Um, grounded in the identity isn't simply one of passivity versus activity any more than it is when he describes our deified state where he does often describe it as purely passive but then we'll qualify sometimes and say it's an active passivity it's and, and, and that's because that's what experience direct interpersonal so intersubjective experience really is it's not simply passive nor active but it's also not a hybrid right it's kind of all of them all at once and, and, and to maybe back to Telly's point, that really is Eros, that really is love. So um, much more to say there, great questions, certainly haven't adequately answered them, but my appreciation to all of you, and I will stop. Thanks, Jordan. Um, Father John, Father Brandon, would you like to uh, come back to, to Jordan or respond to, to his responses at all before we jump into Q&A? Um, no, um one thing that is is sort of tickling at me is is um because i'm not a patristic scholar so i i'm thinking this in light of uh some things that one finds in uh other thinkers like bogakov 
Um, so in Bulgakov, the ascension plays a sort of hinge role that in the ascension, um, uh, the cross, the tomb, the, the whole life of Jesus, uh, um, to speak to what Father John was saying, enters up into the life of God and then retroactively. Uh, and then one thinks, obviously, of the famous thing with uh, Pannenberg. Um, and, and so in some sense, one never can, in a way, climb back, uh, you know, kind of before the event, either of the ascension or the resurrection. But then one wonders, and this is maybe some of what Father John is, is pushing to, um, uh, to, to try to distinguish if, if uh, the Lord, as it were, becomes incarnate in all things, if the world becomes the body of God, um, is then uh, salvation also in some sense in the world? Is that which uh, um, deifies us, that which saves us, is there in some sense in being itself uh, a type of salvific event? Um, here is is to return to Father John's first question, you know, looking for something, uh, you know, that would qualify or make a distinction uh, between what you call the historical incarnation. Uh, and because uh, I suppose, uh, you know, how do you think the fact that the cross may be in being or that that being itself is crucified now? Um, um, perhaps these these are not the sorts of, of things that, that Maximus was inter interested in getting into. They are the sorts of things that Bogakov was getting interested in. And, uh, um, and he saw the nature of being as love uh, to be crucified for, uh, from all ages. In, and then in some sense, one actually did have uh, the cross at the heart of reality. So these are some of the things that I'm turning over in my head, particularly with your notion of, uh, high, you know, the composite hypostasis as a sort of singular individual, uh, endlessly repeatable, uh, exceptional as exceptionless. Okay, can I pick it up, Taylor? Yeah, please. Uh, ben, ben, I think you, you, you kind of hit the, the, the question behind all of my questions in all of that, with the reference to, to Bulgakov and Ascension, or I'll just say the Paschal event. Um, because, t uh, Jordan, you also from time to time talk about the Christ event, but never really specify what you mean by that, nor really in the work. But I think there is in Maximus, you know, the pa Pascha, as a, as a direct thematic component in all of this, you know, and, and a transformative dynamic in all of this, which actually enables us to say the church or creation is a body of Christ in a way we wouldn't say the church or creation is a body of Jesus. Yeah, or the Eucharist is a body and blood of Christ. We would never say the body and blood of Jesus. We might say the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, but never simply the body and blood of Jesus because of the transformation affected through the passion. And then with that, that also opens up a way for thinking about um, Jesus as being the, the crucified and risen Lord Jesus as being the firstborn of many brethren. And then you get into the question of the Esau Christi that you talk about. And it's interesting, it's Esau Christi, not um, Esau Iuzu, Iuz, <laughs> equal to Jesus. Says. So there's something going on in all of that um, that I think is reflected in the language deeply in it, yeah? together with the point that Brandon made about the cross and love. You know, going through the Gospel of John repeatedly, it's striking how how emphatic Jesus is. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life. It's almost like by laying down his life, to use the image, the iron entering into the fire, drawing divinity into himself to, to minister to us as a body of Christ, also is constitutive for who the Father is. But it, it just takes us off into so many other, other directions. And that wasn't what your book was addressing. <laughs> Thank you to you all um, for those wonderful responses. And we could keep the conversation going uh, all day, obviously. Uh, but we do want to get to the uh, Q&A. Um, so, Justin, I'm going to pass it over to you to curate some of these questions that we're getting. 
All right, thanks, thanks again, everybody, for your illuminating questions. Um, there are some common themes emerging uh, in, in the Q&A feature, and so I thought I would, I would just read two representative questions uh, rather than go through all of them. Um, so the first, um, yes, let's go with this one here. The first is this, what are the implications uh, of Jordan's reading of Maximus for the possibilities of Christian Advaita, that is non-duality. Lots of questions about uh, Logi Logos, uh, one in the many sort of situations. And then as an addendum to that, and I think an interesting ecumenical one, um, are non-Chalcedonian churches therefore precluded from participating in Maximus's insights as you helpfully describe them? So if Maximus's uh, solution to these problems um, is the way out of the one in the many problem, where does that leave uh, those who would go with Severus and so on? Thank you. Um, so I'll start with the second one um, because I don't really remember the first one. Oh yeah, it's okay. <laughs> um, so about the uh, non-Chalcedonian traditions, I think it was Grill Meyer who I think like in the in volume two two of his Christ and Christian tradition, I think he rightly says that by the time Sergius. Um, or Severus, sorry, Severus of Antioch, um, gets through with his correspondence and dispute with Sergius Grammaticus, who was, who was attempting to, to give a, a nice, neat proposal to the Miaphysite impulse, to the Cerulean impulse, to say, why don't we just say Christ is an emergent, new, single essence? And he wanted to test one Zia. And, and he had this argument for it, it was like, you know, he, Sergius is Grammaticus, right? So he's, he's sort of trained in logic and saying, why don't we just make this nice and tidy? But Severus rejects that. And he really starts to, to resist going, as it were, for Sergius, going the full way. And so um, Grillmeyer says, you know, by the end of this, of Severus's rebuff of Sergius, it's hard to see, quote, it's hard to see how much difference there really is between the Neo-Calcedonian composite hypostasis and Severus's resistance to a new essence, right? But still one nature of some sort. So I, so that, that's a sort of platform or a background to, to give two quick responses to that question. One would be, I mean, insofar as I think that Maximus's insights haven't even been fully appreciated by the Western or the Orthodox tradition in, in their entirety, there it wouldn't be, you know, prima facie, there would be no obstacle to seeing and appreciating Maximus's insights um, more, a kind of rapprochement between him and say someone like Severus post Sergius. So exactly because we thought, we think in the Chalcedonian traditions that we know what Chalcedon means and therefore set limits. That's exactly a presumption that I would equally want to challenge just as much as I would want to say, yeah, you know, Maximus makes some important criticisms of Severus and Miaphysicism. So he's doing both. And that's always the thing with the Neo-Castodians, they're, they're, they're fighting on all dual fronts. And so the more we think through the implications um, of Chalcedon, it might be precisely because Neo-Castodianism is a development of Chalcedon, they may have developed, and they intentionally tried to, develop to a point where a rapprochement could be. Um, so I actually think maybe it's precisely by taking Maximus's insights more seriously than even his own, those that claim him in their own tradition have, that we could find a rapprochement creatively and speculatively with non-Calcedonian traditions. Because otherwise, you know, because Neo-Calcedonians like Maximus, if they didn't even sense, if they didn't even sense the weight of the objections that non-Calcedonians made, they wouldn't have thought to develop anything, right? So they did think something needed more to be said. And so, so um, the, the other thing, uh, I'll just leave it there uh, on that question. Um, the other question about non-dualism, uh, non-duality, Advaita, I mean, I'm, I'm clearly not uh, qualified to speak about Advaita, um, though I do think um, I do think there could be a lot of potential rapprochements because, of course, um, <laughs> I mean, the, what I'm after here with Maximus is a kind of identity that goes beyond what I call in the book the logic of essence or nature. But the identity isn't without content. It's, it's personal. Right. And so um, thinking through the implications of person, uh, what it means to be that sort of, I mean, it's Constantinople too that calls the union, the hypothetical union, according to synthesis. So it sort of has in inchoately a view of the person as a synthesis, as a unifying uh, 
you know, sort of reality in some way. And so that I think that direction could be all kinds of interesting interreligious um, implications, but I, I'm not qualified to say what they all are. Okay, great. Um, another group of questions, and maybe we can close here as I'm uh, mindful of everyone's time here, especially across the uh, vast expanse of, uh, of time differences that are represented here. Um, there's a group of questions about what comes next for you, Jordan, um, particularly in light of your work to translate Maximus's uh, letters, right? Um, and to combine two questions, how is that going? <laughs> uh, and uh, again, as an addendum to that, has anything you have found there changed your mind about what you've published in the book since uh, you know you wrote it a while ago now? So what comes next uh, with regard to the translation and how has, how has the act of translating Maximus's letters interacted with the claims you've already made? Um, in terms of what comes next, yeah, the, the letters are still ongoing. They're, going, they're slow. They're going at the pace of a stay-at-home dad of four. So, so there you go. Um, but has my mind changed um no in some ways and perhaps this will be taken as a sign of my imposition or something but especially translating the christological letters from you know letters 12 through 19 and i would highlight particularly 15 um in some ways i think um it's <laughs> kind of confirmed to what i thought um i had already read those epistles for the book but you know kind of once you when you translate you have to think in a, in a different way as father john often says and is right about um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, perhaps there's more, like, for example, I'm thinking of Epistle 9, there could be more said about nature, like to tell his question, that Maximus in a very short epistle, he talks about nature and Jesus Christ came to liberate us from time and nature, he says. Um, so that's a pretty clear, uh, you know, whatever nature means there, it's something from which we must be liberated. Um, and so there, that would be another datum, you know, throw into that discussion about the positive and negative senses of nature. So there's just more to work with. And it's amazing to me. They've never been translated into English um, up, up to this point. So I'll keep I'll keep going in terms of projects ahead or things ahead. I just think in general, there needs to be um, much more um, bringing the sources post Chalcedon to to the fore and specifically neo what's called and has been called now for 100 years neo-chalcedonian developments and tradition um many many writers many of which have actually critical editions of their whole corpus but none of them have been translated into english so i think projects that would lie lie in, on the horizon are ones where we're, we're you know i don't i'm not out here just trying to make random claims and trying to say that you know, what does Laodicea of, of Jerusalem, for example, mean when he says that God became in the incarnation the most composite reality in all of creation? <laughs> so, I, you know, that's uh, <clears throat> so the, there's so many texts and there's, you know, what about the Theopascite uh, controversy? Um, you know, uh, what about Anastasius of Sinai's um, sermons on the image, right? All of these things are there, and, and, and they're basically, they're very rarely brought to the fore. Grillmeyer didn't quite get to them before he passed away, and, uh, and, and there's been some work, but not a whole lot. So, um, yeah, so I, I would, I would want to be a, both a part of teams and also maybe some of my own work, try to bring some of this out, because I think part of what's bogging down some of the discussions and what's sort of fueling some of the knee-jerk or vis visceral objections to some of this is just unfamiliarity with, with this stuff. I mean, we end our courses at 451 or we jump to 553 or we jump to the kind of class controversy, and there's not much discussion around uh, all those centuries, five through seven especially. So, um, yeah. That's, I don't know, those are some things I'm up to, but as I said, the, the pace of not even a snail, because uh, snails still have energy and kids destroy your life. But they're wonderful. All right, on that note, uh, Jordan needs to get back to getting his life destroyed. Um, yes. uh, so <laughs> I'll just wrap things up here. Um, if you enjoyed this, you know, nosebleed high stratospheric uh, theological discussion, check out what else the center uh, has to offer. Um, more practical things like commentary on ecclesial happenings or sober analysis of religion's place uh, in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, the next event is on December 12th, uh, is entitled Na Christian Nationalism in the International Perspective, Lessons and Legacies. Again, uh, a webinar like this one uh, of a very different nature, no doubt.
Um, we'll just close by saying, you know, thanks again to our illustrious panelists who have given so generously of their time, uh, Father Deacon Brandon, Telly, and Father, Father John, to Jordan uh, for his work of love and hymn of praise to St. Maximus, uh, and to everybody out there for joining us, and again, uh, to the Center for its Hospitality. Thank you all. Thank you.